Hello everyone. Today we continue our reading of Book 4, Part 1, Mysticism. And today we are reading, um, we're going to be reading Chapter 6, Diana. Um, and this is dealing with the eight limbs of yoga, essentially, as it's interpreted in this, this system of magic and mysticism, okay? Um, yoga, as it's understood <laughs> within the context of this work. Um, so we have asana, distill the body. We have pranayama, control of breath, the eight limbs of yoga. So today we're talking about dhyana, chapter six. And I'm going to uh, leave a link for those that um, would like to buy a copy, commission link. Chapter 6, Diana. This word has two quite distinct and mutually exclusive meanings. The first refers to the result itself. Diana is the same word as the Pali jhana. The Buddha counted eight jhanas, which are evidently different degrees and kinds of trance. The Hindu also speaks of dhyana as a lesser form of samadhi. Others, however, treat it as if it were merely an intensification of dharana. Patanjali says, and quote, Dharana is holding the mind onto some particular object. An unbroken flow of knowledge in that object is dhyana. When that giving up all forms reflects only the meaning, it is samadhi. Unquote. He combines these three into samyana, samyama. We shall treat of dhyana as a result rather than as a method. Up to this point, ancient authorities have been fairly reliable guides, except with regard to their uh, crabbed ethics. But when they got on the subject of results of meditation, they completely lose their heads. They exhaust the possibilities of poetry to declare what is demonstrably untrue. For example, we find in the Shiva Samhita that, quote, He who daily contemplates on this lotus of the heart is eagerly desired by the daughters of gods, has clairaudience, clairvoyance, and can walk in the air, unquote. Another person, quote, can make gold, discover medicine for disease, and see hidden treasures, unquote. All this is filth. What is the curse upon religion that its tenets always must be associated with every kind of extravagance and falsehood? There is one exception. It is the AA, whose members are extremely careful to make no statement at all that cannot be verified in the usual manner, or, where this is not easy, at least to avoid anything like a dogmatic statement. In their second book of Practical Instruction, Liber O, occur these words, quote, By doing certain things, certain results will follow. Students are most earnestly warned against attributing objective reality or philosophical validity to any of them, unquote. <laughs> I want to repeat that. By doing certain things, certain results will follow. Students are most earnestly warned against attributing objective reality or philosophical validity to any of them. Those golden words. In discussing Diana, then, let it be clearly understood that something unexpected is about to be described. We shall consider its nature and estimate its value in a perfectly unbiased way without allowing ourselves the usual rhapsodies or deducing any theory of the universe. One extra fact may destroy some existing theory. That is common enough, but no single fact is sufficient to construct one. It will have been understood that dharana, dhyana, and samadhi form a continuous process, and exactly when the climax comes does not matter. It is of this climax that we must speak, for this is a matter of experience and a very striking one. In the course of our concentration, we notice that the contents of the mind at any moment consisted of two things and no more, the object, variable, and the subject, invariable, 
or apparently so. By success in Dharana, the object has been made as invariable as the subject. Now the result of this is that the two become one. This phenomenon usually comes as a tremendous shock. It is indescribable even by the masters of language, and it is therefore not surprising that semi-educated stutterers wallow in oceans of gush. All the poetic faculties and all the emotional faculties are thrown into a sort of ecstasy by an occurrence which overthrows the mind and makes the rest of life seem absolutely worthless in comparison. Good literature is principally a matter of clear observation and good judgment expressed in the simplest way. For this reason, none of the great events of history, such as earthquakes and battles, have been well described by eyewitnesses unless those eyewitnesses were out of danger. But even when one has become accustomed to Diana by constant repetition, no words seem adequate. One of the simplest forms of Diana may be called the sun, S-U-N. The sun is seen, as it were, by itself, not by an observer. And although the physical eye cannot behold the sun, one is compelled to make the statement that this sun is far more brilliant than the sun of nature. The whole thing takes place on a higher level. Also, the conditions of thought, time, and space are abolished. It is impossible to explain what this really means. Only experience can furnish you with apprehension. This, too, has its analogies in ordinary life. The conceptions of higher mathematics cannot be grasped by the beginner, cannot be explained to the layman. A further development is the appearance of the form, which has been universally described as human, although the persons describing it proceed to add a great number of details which are not human at all. This particular appearance is usually assumed to be God. But whatever it may be, the result on the mind of the student is tremendous. Notice he calls this person a student <laughs> that has this union. But whatever it may be, the result on the mind of the student is tremendous. All his thoughts are pushed to their greatest development. He sincerely believes that they have the divine sanction. Perhaps he even supposes that they emanate from this God. He goes back into the world armed with this intense conviction and authority. He proclaims his ideas without the restraint which is imposed upon most persons by doubt, modesty, and diffidence, while further there is, one may suppose, a real clarification. And the footnote says, This lack of restraint is not to be confused with that observed in intoxication and madness. Yet there is a very striking similarity, though only on a superficial one. And that's the end of the footnote. In any case, the mass of mankind is always ready to be swayed by anything thus authoritative and distinct. History is full of stories of officers who have walked unarmed up to a mutinous regiment and disarmed them by the mere force of confidence. The power of the orator over the mob is well known. It is probably for this reason that the prophet has been able to constrain mankind to obey his law. It never occurs to him that anyone can do otherwise. In practical life, one can walk past any guardian, such as a sentry or ticket collector, if one can really act so that the man is somehow persuaded that you have a right to pass unchallenged. This power, by the way, is what has been described by magicians as the power of invisibility. Somebody or other has an excellent story of four quite reliable men who were on the lookout for a murderer and had instructions to let no one pass and who all swore subsequently in presence of the dead body that no one had passed. None of them had seen the postman. The post office guy is supposed to be there. The thieves who stole the Gioconda from the Louvre were probably disguised as workmen and stole the picture under the very eye of the guardian, very likely got him to help them. It is only necessary to believe that a thing must be to bring it about. 
This belief must not be an emotional or an intellectual one. It resides in a deeper portion of the mind, yet a portion not so deep, but that most men, probably all successful men, will understand these words, having experienced of their own, with which they can compare it. <laughs> the most important factor in dhyana is, however, the annihilation of the ego. Our conception of the universe must be completely overturned. If we are to admit this is valid, and it is time that we considered what is really happening. It will be conceded that we have given a very rational explanation of the greatness of great men. They had an experience so overwhelming, so out of proportion to the rest of things, that they were freed from all the petty hindrances which prevent the normal man from carrying out his projects. Worrying about clothes, money, worrying about clothes, food, money, what people may think, how and why, and above all, the fear of consequences, clog nearly everyone. Nothing is easier, theoretically, than for an anarchist to kill a king. He has only to buy a rifle, make himself a first-class shot, and shoot the king from a quarter of a mile away. And yet, although there are plenty of anarchists, outrages are very few. At the same time, the police would probably be the very first to admit that if any man were really tired of life, in his deepest being, a state very different from that in which a man goes about saying he is tired of life, he could manage somehow or other to kill someone first. Now, the man who has experienced any of the more intense forms of dhyana is thus liberated. The universe is thus destroyed for him and he for it. His will can therefore go on its way unhampered. One may imagine that in the case of Muhammad, one may imagine that in the case of Muhammad, he had cherished for years a tremendous ambition and never done anything because those qualities which were subsequently manifest as a statesmanship warned him that he was impotent. His vision in the cave gave him that confidence which was required, the faith that moves mountains. There, there are a lot of solid-seeming things in this world which a child could push over, but not one has the courage to push. Let us accept provisionally this explanation of greatness and pass it by. Ambition has led us to this point, but we are now interested in the work for its own sake. A most astounding phenomenon has happened to us. We have had an experience which makes love, fame, rank, ambition, wealth look like 30 cents, and we begin to wonder passionately, what is truth? The universe has tumbled about our ears like a house of cards, and we have tumbled too. Yet this ruin is like the opening of the gates of heaven. Here is a tremendous problem, and there is something within us which ravens for its solution. Let us see what explanation we can find. The first suggestion, which would enter a well-balanced mind, versed in the study of nature, is that we have experienced a mental catastrophe. Just as a blow on the head may make a man see stars, so one might suppose that the terrific mental strain of Dharana has somehow overexcited the brain and caused a spasm, or possibly even the breaking of a small vessel. There seems no reason to reject this explanation altogether, though it would be quite absurd to suppose that to accept it would be to condemn the practice. Spasm is a normal function of at least one of the organs of the body. That the brain is not damaged by the practice is proved by the fact that many people who claim to have had this experience repeatedly continue to exercise the ordinary avocations of life without diminished activity. We may dismiss then the physiological question. It throws no light on the main problem, which is the value of the testimony of the experience. Now this is a very difficult question and raises the much larger question as to the value of any testimony. Every possible thought has been doubted at some time or another, except the thought which can only be expressed by a note of interrogation, since to doubt that thought asserts it. 
For a full discussion, see The Soldier and the Hunchback. But apart from this deep-seated philosophic doubt, there is the practical doubt of every day, the popular phrase, quote, to doubt the evidence of one's senses, shows us that evidence is normally accepted. But a man of science does nothing of the sort. He is so well aware that his senses continually deceive him that he invents elaborate instruments to correct them. And he is further aware that the universe, which he can directly perceive through the sense, is the minutest fraction of the universe which he knows indirectly. For example, four-fifths of the air is composed of nitrogen. If anyone were to bring a bottle of nitrogen into the room, it would be exceedingly difficult to say what it was. Nearly all the tests that one could apply to it would be negative. His senses tell him little or nothing. Argon was only discovered at all by comparing the weight of chemically pure nitrogen with that of the nitrogen of the air. This had often been done, but no one had sufficiently fine instruments even to perceive the discrepancy. To take another example, a famous man of science asserted not so long ago that science could never discover the chemical composition of the fixed stars, yet this has been done, and with certainty. If you were to ask your man of science for his theory of the real, he would tell you that the ether... Now, we have to remember when this was written. <laughs> this was written a while back. <laughs> if you were to ask your man of science for his theory of the real, he would tell you that the ether, which cannot be perceived in any way by any of the senses or detected by any instruments and which possesses qualities which are, to the ordinary language, impossible, is very much more real than the chair he is sitting on. The chair is only one fact, and its existence is tested by one very fallible person. The ether is the necessary deduction from millions of facts, which have been verified again and again and checked by every possible test of truth. There is therefore no a priori reason for rejecting anything on the ground that it is not directly perceived by the senses. To turn to another point, one of our tests of truth is the vividness of the impression. An isolated event in the past of no great importance may be forgotten, and if it be in some way recalled, one may find oneself asking, did I dream it, or did it really happen? One can never be forgotten is, what can never be forgotten is the catastrophic. The first death among the people that one loves, for example, would never be forgotten. For the first time, one would realize what one had previously merely known. Such an experience sometimes drives people insane. Men of science have been known to commit suicide when their pet theory has been shattered. This problem has been discussed freely in Science and Buddhism, Time, The Camel, and other papers. See Crowley Collected Works. This much only need we say in this place, <laughs> this much only need we say in this place, that Dharana has to be classed as the most vivid and catastrophic of all experiences. This will be confirmed by anyone who has been there. It is then difficult to overrate the value that such an experience has for the individual, especially as it is his entire conception of things including his most deep-seated conception, the standard to which he has always referred everything, his own self. That is overthrown, and when we try to explain it away as hallucination, temporary suspension of the faculties, or something similar, we find ourselves unable to do so. You cannot argue with a flash of lightning that has knocked you down. Any mere theory is easy to upset. One can find flaws in the reasoning process, one can assume that the premises are in some way false, but in this case, if one attacks the evidence for Diana, the mind is staggered by the fact that all other experience attacked on the same lines will fall much more easily. In whatever way we examine it, the result will always be the same. Diana may be false, but if so, so is everything else. Now the mind refuses to rest in a belief of the unreality of its own experiences, 
It may not be what it seems, but it must be something, and if, on the whole, ordinary life is something, how much more must be that of whose light ordinary life seems nothing? The ordinary man sees the falsity and disconnectedness and purposelessness of dreams. He ascribes them, rightly, to a disordered mind. The philosopher looks upon waking life with similar contempt and the person who has experienced dhyana takes the same view but not by mere pale intellectual conviction reasons however cogent never convince utterly but this man in dhyana has the co same commonplace certainty that a man has on waking from a nightmare i wasn't falling down a thousand flight of stairs it was only a bad dream similarly comes the reflection of the man who has had experience of dhyana quote, i am not that wretched insect that an imperceptible parasite of earth it was only a bad dream and as you could not convince the normal man that his nightmare was more real than his awakening so you cannot convince the other that his dhyana was hallucination, even though he is only too well aware that he has fallen from the state of normal life. It is probably rare for a single experience to upset thus radically the whole conception of the universe, just as sometimes in the first moments of waking there remains a, a half-doubt as to whether dream or waking is real. but as one gains further experience when dhyana is no longer a shock when the student note he's calling this person a student has had plenty of time to make himself at home in the new world this conviction will become absolute the footnote says it should be remembered that at present there is no data for determining the duration of dhyana one can only say that, since it certainly occurred between such and such hours, it must have lasted less than that time. Thus we see from Frauder P.'s record that it can certainly occur in less than an hour and five minutes. That's the end of the footnote. Another rationalist consideration is this. The student has not been trying to excite the mind, but to calm it, not to produce any one thought but to exclude all thoughts, for there is no connection between the object of meditation and the dhyana. Why must we suppose a breaking down of the whole process, especially as the mind bears no subsequent traces of any interference, such as pain or fatigue? Surely this once, if ever again, the Hindu image expresses the simplest theory. That image is that of a lake into which five glaciers move these glaciers are the senses while ice the impressions is breaking off constantly into the lake the waters are troubled if the glaciers are stopped the surface becomes calm and then and only then can it reflect unbroken the disk of the sun this sun is the soul or god we should however avoid these terms for the present on account of their implications let us rather speak of the sun as some unknown thing whose presence has been masked by all things known and by the knower. It is probable, too, that our memory of Dhyana is not the phenomenon itself, but of the image left thereby on the mind. But this is true of all phenomena, as Berkeley and Kant have proved beyond all question. This matter, then, need not concern us. We may, however, provisionally accept the view that dhyana is real, more real and thus of more importance to ourselves than all other experience. This state has been described not only by the Hindus and Buddhists, but by Mohammedans and Christians. In Christian writings, however, the deeply seated dogmatic bias has rendered their documents worthless to the average man. They ignore the essential conditions of dhyana, and insist on the inessential to a much greater extent than the best indian writers but to anyone with experience and some knowledge of comparative religion the identity is certain we may now proceed to samadhi okay and that is it for that and uh then tomorrow we will continue with chapter seven samadhi
So we are just reading occult classics. Um, this is book four. And it's important for people to understand the different systems of magic. And, and this is one of those important occult classics. Okay, book four. And I'm going to leave a, a, a link. And I hope everyone has a wonderful day. And uh, see y'all in the next video. Have a great day, everyone.